patients manage to ingest or insert an iPod, a gun, even dolls have shown up on x-rays and now a picture book of wayward x-ray items has been published by a trio of physicians. See, as Genimos gets to the bottom of things. Didn't we say that this goes here and not in here? An electrical cord x-rayed in somebody's gut? And there are a hundred of these. What was the gun doing up there? Well, with the tuna can lid. The tweeters. What could they have been trying to pluck? The x-rays are all in a new book called Stuck Up, 100 Objects Inserted and Ingested in Places They Shouldn't Be. It's co-authored by this emergency room physician and two other doctors. We doubt the patient's going to be able to pass the salt or the pepper mill or the egg beater or the chopsticks. Most commonly, we do see long, slender objects because that is the most form-fitting. We're not going to dwell on how these everyday objects ended up where the sun don't shine. Most of the time, it was not an accident, though often that's what people claimed. I accidentally fell on an object. That's probably the most common accidental story you hear. And who hasn't sat on their glasses really, really hard while nude? The doctors say the x-rays are real, though outlines of some objects are graphically enhanced so the reader can easily see them. Everything from a computer mouse to a cassette tape. That was definitely an older x-ray. A more recent x-ray <laughs> displays an iPod Nano. We can only imagine its playlist. <laughs> so how did that gun get stuck in That's the middle? That's just dangerous. People love their guns. The good news. It was not loaded. So maybe the patient was. And you thought a light bulb went off in your head. How about this light bulb in someone's gut? And this string of Christmas lights, the series Scrubs, did a whole oh, episode on the subject. <laughs> this kid has a light bulb up his butt or his colon has a great idea. Scrubs accurately <laughs> described how to remove a light bulb. All you need to do is thread an angioplasty balloon past the bulb, inflate it, and then it pull. One of the oddest items to be where that tuna lid rolled up like a cigar ended up. But the doctor's favorite found objects are action Buzz figures for Buzz Lightyear from Toy Story. To infinity and beyond here. He said beyond, not behind. And this is Barbie, but it isn't her dream house she's in. Gimo, CNN. Hey, do you have a magazine? Not in me. I mean, on me. <laughs> New York. <laughs> I, I'm just oh, shocked. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> How? Oh. Oh. Um, it's a very common... Thing when you work in a hospital, you see a lot of objects, especially gel tape. Um, I mean, a lot of inmates like to swallow razors for some reason when I work with them. I have to do an Adam next to see what the razor goes through the body. Um, probably because they want to get out of the hospital, out of jail, so it could be in the hospital. Different scenario. Um, so, yeah, so. so <laughs> a razor. Yeah. Just Whatever motivates you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> X-ray production. So this is one to seven of you. In order to generate X-ray, we need to have three things happen at once. Uh, we need a source of electrons, and that is where the cathode provides the electrons through the process of fermionic emission. And there's Electrons have to escape at a very high speed, so they have to accelerate from the cathode to the anode within an inch apart at a very fast velocity. In fact, they travel almost at the speed of light. And then they would, and then when it goes through the uh, from the cathode to the anode, it have to hit a target. So that's where the tungsten disk comes into play. The interaction between the thermal emission of electrons and the electrons atoms of the tungsten disk, uh, fast-paced collision, then produces X-ray photons that emit out from the, from the tube. In the process of uh, producing X-ray, uh, two things can occur. We have the primary beams on one side, and then after the primary beam interacts with the object, it then produces scatter radiation. The interaction between the X-ray tube, uh, between the filament electrons and the anode, Target atoms. So the filament electrons, the pulse of thermal emission, and the tungsten disk, the electrons interact with the atoms of the tungsten disk. 
In this process, it produced <coughs> two useful diagnostic X-ray beams. One is referred to Branson log X-ray radiations, and the other is called characteristics X-ray radiations. Um, so those are two primary beams, useful primary beams come out from the tube. One of these beams interact with the patient or whatever, it then produces scattered or secondary radiations. And there's five types of scattered secondary radiations that you need to know. Classical, Compton, photoelectric, hair production, and for disintegration, ranging from the lowest, from the weakest energy to the highest energy level. We're gonna discuss more of this uh, next week. <coughs> Today we're gonna discuss mainly about Bremsalot radiation and characteristic radiation. Yes? What are those five types of uh, radiation? Those are scat scattered secondary <laughs> radiation. <coughs> Do you remember the first day we talked about the scatter? <coughs> so these are the different types of scatters. <coughs> interactions from electrons and the target disk, three things occur. I mentioned for the uh, production of Bram's unlock radiation, very known just Bram's radiation, and catches radiation. It also produces a generate a lot of heat during the production of X-ray. In fact, the production of X-ray is very, very inefficient. Uh, a vast majority of those electron interactions will convert into heat. Or will, why very select so like few actually becomes X-rays. So we can talk about heat production. <coughs> Electrons that travel from the cathode to the anode, one to two centimeters, which is about less than an inch or so, travel close to the speed of light, half speed of light. Those thermo, uh, through the process of thermal emissions, these electrons refer as projectile electrons. So it's projectile from the cathode to the anode, very, very high speed. Some of these electrons, projectile electrons, in, will convert into <coughs> X-ray photons, while a vast majority will just interact with the atoms of the Thomson disk and become uh, and just become heat. In fact, 99% of the en connected energy of the projected electrons is converted to heat. Only about 1% of those thermal emissions actually convert into X-ray photons. So it's very inefficient <laughs> on average. <coughs> so to increase the efficiency of X-ray productions, uh, the higher the kV kilovolt, the energy level, the higher the effic efficiency of X-ray productions. So when we talk about like in the radiation therapy, it's <coughs> the megavolts. So it's generate more than one percent. And I can't remember exactly. I think it's like five percent of the X rays uh, of the mega electron volt compared to um, action pressures. So it's very, very inefficient. If you can find a better way to produce X ray, you could become a millionaire. <laughs> I'll be on there. So the higher the KV, the more efficiency extra production is occurring. Okay. okay, heat units. <coughs> different type of generator will generate different type of heat units. And this just measure um, a heat unit is not temperature scale, so it's used on, a, on anode cooling charts to determine how long it takes 
to cool off the X-ray T. With a single phase um, generator, the basic formula to calculate the heat units will be just the techniques and then the number of exposures. So the following will be KV times MA times second, or just KV and mass if it's combined, plus times the number of exposures. With three phase, uh, six poles, everything the same, with uh, such a <coughs> new, uh, included 1.35 constant number. Three phase, 12 poles, everything the same as single phase. The difference is you have two times with a constant number of 1.41. And then we have high frequency generator. Of the same with the exception that you use a constant number of 1.45 um, as your constant number to calculate the heat unit. Since a single phase, I will just multiply possible with the technique and exposure. So 75 times 100 times 25 <coughs> times 3. So the heat unit from this Example. <coughs> what is the heat unit from a single exposure at 100 MA, 60 kV, 5 milliseconds, <coughs> a distance of 120 centimeters using three phase 12 pulse generator? What is the constant number? 1.41. 1. 1. 1. So we're going to multiply 60 times 100 times 5 milliseconds. Move the decimal over. 1, 2, 3. So it'll be 0. 0.005. Times 1.41. How many exposure? 1. 1. So we'll need to write that one. It says five milliseconds. From this one single exposure based on the bond technique. Thanks. 
very straightforward. Just come with the techniques and then number exposure and what type of generator is being used. Unit, we generate in a three phase exposed unit using the four exposure factors. We have 70 KV, 100 MA, and 500 milliseconds. <coughs> it didn't specify how many exposure we have, so I'm just assuming it's going to be just 10. With the three phase exposed, um, the constant number we can use will be Forty-seven, twenty-five. That's mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 4, Based on this number, when you actually look at the chart, like uh, anacrine chart, the decentral scale, and there's a timing, you just determine the unit, and then you just determine how long it takes for it. Bramson log radiation, or just known as Bram's radiation. It's a German word meaning to break or slow down. The process of producing this type of radiation occur when the electrons, the, those projected electrons, come very close to the uh, atom of the tungsten. As it get close to the nucleus of the tungsten atom, it slows down. The slowing down process <coughs> then releases energy in the form of X-ray photons. So that's why we call Bremsen log radiation, because it's, uh, it comes very close <laughs> to the nucleus of the atom, of the tungsten, and then the slowing down releases the energy in the form of X-ray photons. Um, with the production of uh, Brems X-ray radiations, there's no ionization to occur. It, does, it doesn't kick off an electron from the tungsten gas. Uh, it doesn't mean that Brems <coughs> radiation it's not ionized. It's just the production of this type of X-ray has no ionization <coughs> in the process. Brass radiation constitutes a vast majority of the X-ray used for diagnostic X-ray coming out from the tube. It's a combo 80 to 90 percent of the radiation coming out from the X-ray tube. Now, as you increase <coughs> the level of KV or NG strength of the technique. Bram's radiation will also increase in both quantity and quality, or the number of X-ray and the strength of X-ray. And on the all average, Bram's radiation is about one third of the average. Remember on the first day of first lecture, I mentioned one of the property of X-ray is polyanogenic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it ranges from whatever technique you set, from zero to your technique. And if you call the same example, 90 kV, your technique, so it range from zero to 90. And on the average, it's about one third. So if 90 kV, what's the average of 90? 30. So it means 30 kV. <coughs> so on the average.
So it's just a drawing uh, of how it works. The project electrons come from the cathode, go on to the atoms of the chunky disk, get close to the nucleus. As they get close to the nucleus, it slowed down. And then when it slowed down, it releases energy in the form of extra radiation, and we call it Graham's radiation due to the process. And then the project electron move out the way. No ionizations occur in this process. The other type of radiation coming off from two, actually here's an aggregation. Uh, would be characteristic radiation. This constitutes a power of 10 to 20 percent of the extra productions, depending on the level of energy. Catalytic radiations uh, produced occur when the filament electrons, those special project electrons, <coughs> interact with the shell level. And when it interacts with the shell level, it would then knock those electrons out. When, it, when, when the electron got knocked out, it wants to fill in that hole. So the next shell level, whatever shell level, will move in will <coughs> and place that uh, missing electrons. As one shell uh, electron from one shell level moves to the next shell level, it then releases energy. And this energy is referred to cancer radiations. Um, and we name cathodic radiation based on what <coughs> hole or what gap the shell level is uh, filling in. <coughs> if, let's say for example, an electron is knocked out at the K shell level, remember K is the first shell, and then the electrons from a different level move in, filling that hole, K shell hole, we refer as K characteristics x-ray radiation. If L uh, shell electrons are removed and a different shell moves in to replace that gap, then we first L shell electrons. So whatever the electrons missing and moving in to fill that will be put based on the shell level. And in diagnostic x-ray, only K characteristic x-ray is used for. <coughs> Every other type of uh, characteristic radiations is useless. It's not, it's not, it doesn't account for diagnostic x-ray. The patient just absorbs that. So is it considered scatter radiation? No, it's just weak energy. Okay. Because these, these are the primary beam, characteristic and advanced radiation that's coming out from the x-ray tube refers as primary beam. After it interacts with the patient or, or the object, it then refers as scatter radiation. And you're saying X-ray energy is emitted through the process of that electron moving from one shell to the other? Yep. And then we named the, we named the characteristic based on whatever shell is floating in. <clears throat> the energy of the catch radiation is based on the differences of the binding energy that it's moving from one shell moving into the other shell. So where the binding energy is. For example, K characteristic of tungsten disk has an energy binding of, at the K level, 69 kV. And let's say the next shell, it doesn't have to be the next shell, it could be any shell that moves in to cause it like that. And if the one that actually moves out, L shell have a uh, binding energy of 12. The difference between 69 and 612. That's the energy strength of the K characteristic. As the atomic number increases of uh, the material, <coughs> catalytic radiation will also increase. So it's based on different values. In order for to have useful diagnostic X-rays, the energies have to be 69 kV. The project electrons have to be strong enough. Have to be at least 69 in order to not the K binding energy from the tungsten disk. If it's weaker than that, it won't knock down the K binding energy. It will knock down other K um, binding energy, such, maybe such as L, M, but won't knock down K. 
and those L, M, and so forth will be just useless x-rays. Not useless, it just won't account as part of the diagnostic x-ray. The only thing that's useful is the K characteristics x-rays. So anything below that, just absorb, the patient absorb. And when you increase in the energy of the x-ray, when energy increases, what happens to frequency again? In increases. Increases and wavelength decreases, right? <coughs> so with K characteristics, ionizations, the process of ionization occur in this type of X-ray production. Because it's knocking out the electrons. Because right? it's, it's knocking out electrons from the tungsten dust cloud. From the electrons, or multiple electrons. So those are two prime differences in terms of how X-ray produced. And, how, and those are two that's coming out from the DNA, from the, from the tissue. Project electron, knock out K shell, and then any shell level will move in and fill that gap. As it moves in, it releases an X ray photon. And the only other K shell. Hmm? It, it has to be the K shell. It has to be K shell. I mean, it could move in, it could knock out other shell. But for it to be it productive, will, right? It, it, won't, it won't be used for diagnostic X ray. It, the only useful, mm -hmm. useful uh, diagnostic X rays in characteristic X ray will be K characteristic X ray, named after K shell. Other type of uh, characteristic x ray, L characteristic, M characteristics, N characteristics, would not be used for diagnostic x rays. So it's just by chance which one it hits? Yeah. Any other questions? So, I mean, in theory, there's all multiple type of <coughs> characteristics coming out, too. but only K characteristics. versus the X-ray energy. And since it's polyenergetic, polyenergetic it ranges from zero uh, kV coming out from the tube all the way to whatever the setting is. And at the point 69, that's where the, the energy that's needed for K characteristics to produce, you see a spike right here, and then it goes down there. Uh, X-ray emission spectrum. X-ray emission spectrum is pretty much a graph that represents the amount of X-rays coming out from the tube. And we base this on the number of X-rays versus the energy of the X-ray. So quantity and quality. Pretty much that's what it is. Quantity and quality. Number of X-rays is the quantity. X-ray energy is the quality of the X-ray. 